This episode of Linux Action Show is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. And by Ting.com. Head over to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device. Welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 25, Episode 10. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey there, Matt. Good morning to you, sir. Good and, morning. Uh, guess what, Matt? Guess what? What's that? Big show today. Big show. Big, big show today. In fact, I'll tell you guys what we have coming up. So uh, in the second half of the show, we're going to cover Clonezilla. We've talked about it a few times here and there, but we've never really gone in-depth. So we'll do a tutorial today on backing up your system with Clonezilla and then restoring it. I'm going to go in there, I'll show you how I back it up, and then I'm just going to tear my system apart. I'm going to like RM-RF a few important <laughs> critical directories, make sure that sucker can't boot, and then we'll restore it to a completely working condition in this week's episode. Plus, in the latter half of the show, we're going to get a Big batch of your feedback. We're going to tear through a bunch of questions that have been sent into the show. So uh, stay tuned. We have a lot of good tips there as well. Of course, we're going to talk about the news and all of the goodies that have cropped up throughout the week. And I've got a fun little pick for you guys. But first, speaking of picks, it's our apps and desktop and Android picks, uh, Matt. So uh, right what do you say we start with our runs Linux this week, which for the season finale of, ep of season 25, the okay. post-Jack Bauer season, as I've often called it. <laughs> we have probably one of the best insights into our audience, finally, via the Runs Linux pick. That's right, Matt. Bar games run Linux, and I want to thank us, Stormson85, <laughs> for uh, sending this one into our subreddit. And what I love, he's like, hey, guys, look at this. I got this picture of this game, you know, those little arcade games they have at right. bars, you know, for you know, little mini gambling or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And uh, he caught it during a reboot, and he, picked, he got a snap here of it... Uh, Booting up, I thought, oh, that's really great. I got to make this my runs Linux, right? Then the part that really tickled me, Matt. Then a bunch of other people in the thread like, oh, yeah, I've got pictures of that, too. Oh, yeah, I've got a picture. I can confirm that. Here's another picture. And so what I've kind of <laughs> discovered is apparently some of the folks in our subreddit spend a decent amount of time in bars, and they're snapping pictures of it running Linux. And they've Just been holding out. It. They've been holding out. But finally, they sent them in. And I love I love it when we get some in the Linux, uh, uh, some I guess you'd call them action shots, some action Linux in shots. action shots. Well, yeah. and what's interesting, I have a little insight on this. I've been known to frequent a uh, gambling establishment or three and uh, <laughs> play, <laughs> playing, uh, playing myself a little slots. You know, you're always on my way out the door to go and uh, be a productive member of society, of course. Of course. Of course. And I've noticed that one time one of these things was rebooting, and it appeared to me, and I looked to, it was actually running. I saw Tux up here in the upper left-hand corner. Oh, yeah, corner. like for the one During, processor yep. kind of thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it ran a little Linux. So I think that the gambling industry said, you know, really, honestly, uh, this is where we want to put our trust in. So I think it's cool. Yeah, I have, uh, I have a friend who works at a local uh, gamb gambling establishment just mm -hmm. up the freeway from me, and uh, he works in their IT department. And he kind of echoed the same thing. He said, a lot of the slot machines here, now some of them do run Windows. In fact, right. I, I think I even... I think at one point I even, like a long time ago, showed a picture when I traveled to Vegas and I saw a uh, vending, or not a vending machine, a, uh, a, 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 what are they called? Slot machine. I saw a re, uh, blue screen, reboot and blue screen. Uh, but uh, he said that a lot of them, they switched out to older versions of Linux because they're hardened, but mm -hmm. still pretty cool. So when, you know, when you're blowing your money, at least you're blowing it away on, on a Linux box. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And some fast food restaurants, which I won't get into specifics, but one of them actually through their drive through was blue screening. So that was kind of interesting. <laughs> and uh, yeah, last, after eating the food, I could see why. Last so. week on TechSnap, I, uh, I showed a hack of a Windows XP embedded ATM. Mm. And the guy walks up, he puts in a couple of special cards, and uh, one of them has USB storage on it. And within a few minutes, he's loading Angry Birds on the XP embedded ATM. And he's playing Angry Birds. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can see why they might want to choose Linux. Oh my! Yeah. Uh, well, Matt, I've got a uh, I've got a great, great Android pick this week, and uh, an awesome desktop pick that the timing I think is going to be perfect for a lot of you out there, especially those of you in the U.S. Uh, but first, speaking of spending a lot of money while gambling. How about I save you some money, Matt? That way you can go out and have some more fun. Check out this outrageous deal from our sponsor, GoDaddy.com. Twelve months of economy hosting for just a dollar a month. 
What? Like a, a buck. Like, wow. One dollar a month. That's Matt. crazy. One dollar a month. So if you've had oh. any project you want to put up on the public oh. web, or if you've been running something on an internal server in your house and you've been contemplating and getting out right. of your house, maybe your ISP has been blocking ports, take advantage of this awesome offer. A dollar a month economy hosting. Now, this is for new plans only, but use sure. the code HOSTDEAL3 when you're checking out at GoDaddy.com and you'll get one dollar hosting that's crazy that's what a great crazy. opportunity for new projects right i mean because then there's there's no risk <laughs> it's like wow you know there you it is you know i was talking to danica about this and i said danica you know people are talking less and less about your awesome deals and more about your race car shenanigans and right. i know that while you're extremely proud of your race car prowess you really want to be known for the great deals you get people on the linux action show i mean who wouldn't right so Absolutely. I said, could we step it up you know let's get people to stop talking about the race car let's get them talking about deals so she also scored us a second deal. Maybe you maybe you're already a customer. Maybe you have some renewals you want to do. Maybe you don't want hosting. We've got Go 35 off 3 when you check out. Go 35 off 3 gets you 35% off your entire order, whatever it might be, over at the GoDaddy.com. Nice. Go 35 off nice. 3 to save 35% or host deal 3, because it's you know, March. Host deal 3 to get hosting for a dollar a month for a year. So that no, 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 the thirty five percent off that you're talking about now that could actually work if I wanted to like maybe consolidate my existing domains things like that. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, or so you got, if you got some renewals, nice. that's See, I, that's where I, the mm -hmm. meat potatoes really come in. Mm -hmm. if you got a lot, especially if you got a lot of stuff, make it really count. You know? Yeah, that's yeah. Awesome. You really feel like you're getting a deal too. Yeah. yeah. So thank you to GoDaddy.com for the awesome deals and the very 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 long time support of the Linux Action Show and thank you everybody out there who takes advantage of these deals and thank you for visiting the links in our show notes to let GoDaddy know that even if you don't have anything to buy right now you're still paying attention and you appreciate them supporting the show and you want to check out their site. Absolutely. All right, Matt, let me tell you about this Android pick because I think right. this could solve some problems for a lot of folks out there, especially if you want to maybe sync podcasts that you've oh, downloaded yeah. on your desktop to your Android device. Maybe you want to get photos on and off your Android device. Anything that you have on one machine on your house that you want to have move between your Android, uh, right. tablet, phone, whatever. It's called Sync Me Wireless. It's absolutely free in the Android marketplace and allows you to copy, move, and sync all basically anything from your SD card to a Samba share on your network. And it is extremely powerful because it also supports uh, some intelligent, like, R-Sync type syncing. It oh, supports yeah? scheduled syncing, so you can say only sync at uh, midnight. It also supports, uh, hey, I just detected that you joined your home wireless network. Now that you're on this, now that I've seen this SSID, which you automatically like me to sync, which is very nice, so you don't even have to think about it. You can set up certain types of rules and conditions. You can sync to multiple computers. So, for example, uh, I have it set right now. I'm just starting to play with this, but I have it set to sync down some MP3s that I download for the radio, the JB radio. So I'm like, well, sure. why, do I, why download those twice if I'm going to listen to them and put them on the radio? So I have my home server downloading them, and then I have this syncing to my Android device. So I'm only downloading the files once that way, and I have it set to only do it if I'm plugged in and it's after a certain time and I'm on my Wi-Fi. Oh, I love that granular control, and I love the fact that you, you know, you're just more efficient. Instead of repeating your steps over and over, you're able to do it once and then enjoy it. I yeah, and the that. UI is super easy to use. You, yeah. put in the, you put in some credentials. It'll automatically go out and do an SMB scan of your network and find nice. all the Samba servers on your network. It'll, allow, it'll browse their folder structure. You can set which folder is on there. It's very fast once it's found all of the Samba servers. You can move one or two files at a time, or you can just have this intelligent sync set up. And it's absolutely free. It's absolutely love free. That. It's got an average uh, 4.6 rating in the Android uh, Play Store with nearly 100,000 downloads. Sync wow. Me Wireless. And uh, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. And love that. Uh, uh, I've, I loaded on my Nexus 7, which I just recently put back on Android from Ubuntu Touch. And this was a great way to get a lot of stuff moved over. You know, nice. After a clean nice. install. Yeah. Cool. All right, Matt. Let's talk about our desktop app pick this week. All right. So did you see my Google Plus thread where I said, hey, do you guys want me to talk about Usenet? I did, yeah. I did. And then and everybody's was, like, don't talk about Usenet. That was interesting. That was some yeah. interesting yeah. responses. Some there, people are like, sure. yes, I want you to talk about Usenet, please. And some people are like, Chris, if you talk about Usenet one more time, I'm going to come over there and break your knees. Don't you know the well, first rule of, of Usenet? Fight Club rules apply. Yeah, thing, yeah. yeah, exactly. And here's, and I've, I've, we've kind of talked about it before, but the reason why it's kind of come up is uh, the U.S. just enacted the six strikes law where mm -hmm. all of the major commercial ISPs are colluding together to just add you to a blacklist if you sure. have violated their their whatever standards they might be following. Right. And the issue that I have with this is I use torrents, f and they're primarily looking at BitTorrent traffic, I should clarify. I use torrents for a ton of legitimate stuff, you know, 
obviously distro downloads, but all kinds. If somebody makes something available via torrent, I generally grab it via torrent. Yeah. And the problem is, is I don't necessarily have the faith in these various companies' technical abilities to determine when I'm downloading something legitimate or when I'm pirating. Or, or what if, what if they're just basing it based on the different peers that I connect to, and maybe they've identified one peer who's just been pirating a ton of Hollywood content. Exactly. Oh my goodness, right? And they see me connecting to that peer. And they and see that's me. most likely how they would actually ping you at that point. Right, and yeah. maybe we're just sharing a torrent of uh, of the latest Fedora, right? Mm -hmm. So I do not like this at all. So I've already been a longtime Usenet user, and I'm just switching more and more everything over to Usenet. One of the fundamental issues that Usenet has, and this was one of the common questions in that G plus thread, was Usenet doesn't have like a tracker system. There, right. you know, it, you kind of need a Google that indexes all of Usenet that then you can go search against. The issue is, is this is kind of the attack vector that the Hollywood lobbyists have, is they shut down these indexes so that way you can't go find pirated material on Usenet. Maybe it's on there, but you can't find it. And it could be legitimate or pirated. So I want to tell you about, uh, uh, now it's going to take some work on your part, but you can load it on any Linux box, and I think they have packages for Windows available too, mm -hmm. and it creates a self-indexer for Usenet on your own local computer. So you don't have to worry about Hollywood shutting it down. Oh, wow. You run it yourself. You need a Usenet account, obviously, because that's mm -hmm. to log into Usenet servers and download stuff, but it creates a web-based self-index. It's called Spot Web, and it's open source. Uh, it does require that you have an existing web server of some kind and PHP 5 on your system. Mm -hmm. Th I, I We'll link to how-to articles for several different distributions on how to do that. And the other disclaimer I will make is some parts of the application are in French or something. Um, now, Google Chrome automatically will translate those for you, so it actually hasn't been much of a hindrance for me. But at, at the end, what you get is a web-based directory that you can filter based on type of movie or content, or so you can say, I want, I want books, I want audio, I want ISOs, I want HD files, I want TV shows, I want podcasts. I want open source, you know, everything. And it will go out there and find it. And then you just do Google type search queries and it will come back. It'll generate an NZB file for you. Okay, now that's important because this NZB yeah. file lets you throw it in your favorite Usenet client and then right. download it from Usenet. The I other like thing, that. Yeah. yeah, it's very, you know, it's 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 not super easy, but it's 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 very much allowing you to be completely self-reliant and not requiring... It, it shouldn't be that hard. I mean, you know, really, you just install the stuff you would, for, you know, kind of take a LAMP approach, you know, get some Apache on exactly. there. Exactly. It can't be that big a deal. It re it's really not. And uh, so it'll also integrate with uh, a few of my other favorite programs like Couch Potato, Sick Beards, uh, and, uh, and wow. Headphones. So if you know what those things are, you love the fact that it integrates with those. If you don't know what those things are, go Google Sick Beard, Couch Potato, and Headphones. Um, and then you'll see why SpotWeb integrating with them is really kind of a huge deal because it can automate a huge part of, like, when a new Fedora uh, uh, ISO hits Usenet, it can just automatically find it and download it for you. And then, exactly. you know, you can just go to your computer and have the ISO already there. It's, it's, got, uh, it's, got, some, it's got some nice nice features. It does have some, some issues. But like I said, the link I included uh, will walk, through, walk you through troubleshooting a lot of those things, everything from Fedora to, to Ubuntu and Windows and Raspberry Pis, which is awesome. Oh, oh so, yeah. Go check like. out Spot Web, and Spot Web again is a Usenet indexer that does require you have uh, at least Apache and PHP five installed. I don't believe you need the MySQL part. I might be wrong on that. I don't remember because I set it up months ago. I'm sure. Yeah, for database and I, most things are kind of an Apache My, My MySQL and uh, little PHP. Usually version numbers are pretty loose and fancy, but yeah, yeah, it shouldn't be too bad. Now, uh, Maggio uh, is correcting me that it's it's Deutsch, not French, which Deutsch. is good. Okay. Um, and of course, uh, I've also been told that I have I've said too much. I have said too much, Matt. I think that's all I will say. Uh, <laughs> but I have supplied those with the information that if they know what to do with, can enrich their lives. And if you don't, then just go about your day and pretend like I didn't mention this. Absolutely. I mean, it's the best. It's the only and best way to really get the latest in distributions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, you can join the Linux Action Show live Sunday mornings over at jblive.tv. You can participate in the live chat room that we're always uh, paying attention to. And so that's live at 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, that's, uh, what, 6 p.m. over in London. And... Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's 10 a.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv. And, you know, if you tune in live, you get, like, almost twice as much show. You really do. You no, really it's always do. good. Yeah. Yeah, it's always a good idea. All right, Matt. Well, uh, I have just one last little uh, mini reminder plug just because it's wrapping up right mm -hmm. now. I just want to let people know that uh, we have uh, the TechSnap 100 T-shirt. It's yeah. only available for two more days. So I just, you, yeah, I'm putting this out there right now because if you're downloading this, you've probably missed the window. We haven't got it yet. 
But I just want to give it one last mention. It's thirteen dollars and thirty seven cents. Go over to teespring.com slash techsnap one hundred and celebrate a hundred episodes in a row of the TechSnap nice. program by grabbing yourself a limited edition shirt with Alan's face right on your chest. I love that. I love that. And well, and one question I've been getting from a few people is the shirt will ship once the completion date is hit. Does yeah. that sound about right? I yeah. would assume like within a few days of that because they're gonna print days, them, but it's, you know. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. It'll cool. uh, that's one of the reasons we, we kinda we have it expiring. So uh, we're recording TechSnap 100 this Thursday, and if uh, you've ever watched TechSnap, uh, join us live because we're doing back-to-back two shows. I mean, that's so much show. And we wanted them to actually, like, the sale to be finished by the time we went live with episode 100. So they'll ship hopefully a few days after episode 100 is released. That's kind of like the timing we're trying to work all out. Nice, nice. Yeah. And, of course, we'll have that shirt link in the show notes for you, I'm sure. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Absolutely. All right, Matt. Well, let's do the news. <laughs> It's the news, and this episode is brought to you by... Ting.com, brand new sponsored Linux action show. Welcome to Ting.com. Matt, I think this is the perfect sponsor for our audience, and I am a happy customer. So I'll just put it out there. I hate me a cell phone contract, Matt. I just, I, I don't know. I think I moved beyond that. Originally, I was all about it to get the discounts, mm-hmm. but I feel like I'm past that. And Ting.com, boy, are they just, that's just part of what Ting.com answers. Uh, they're, this is mobile that makes sense. It's a no BS mobile service provider. Now, Ting is an MVNO of Sprint, which means if you've got good Sprint coverage in your, your area, you've got great Ting coverage, and that includes their uh, 4G services. I have, uh, I reactivated just recently my Evo 4G. Nice. Matt, this is this is the future of telephone companies. I go to their website, and within, I don't know, 15 minutes max, and I think six or seven steps, I ported my existing Evo over to Ting service, got wow. it activated, and I have to tell you, I was extremely impressed by their plans. Check this out. So you know me. I'm not a big phone guy, right? Sure. We were talking on the pre-show. I, I prefer to use data over phone. I'll use the phone when I have to, but honestly, mm-hmm. I don't use it that much. But I'm constantly on the web. I'm constantly trying out new apps. I'm downloading podcasts all the time. So for me, I'm more about data and less about voice. Well, check out this. Ting has this amazing pay-for-what-you-use system. So I can go in here and I can select only, say, 100 minutes of voice a month. But maybe I want a, a gigabyte a month of data and zero text messages because right, I use Google sense. Voice. You know, I don't need text. I use Google Voice and mm-hmm. I don't use a lot of minutes. So I set it to 100 minutes, zero text and a gigabyte of data, boom, $33 a month for my plan. You see, they let you mix and match here on their uh, plan picker. And what I love about this is not only is it contract-free, which is absolutely awesome, but... Love that. Well, love this even more. They credit you on your unused service. If you use less than you thought you would, Ting drops you down to the level you hit and credits you the difference on your next bill. Also, no add-on charges for things like voicemail, caller ID, tethering, hotspot, or three-way calling. So I have turned my WiMAX-capable Evo into a tethered hotspot at no additional cost. Just you, you buy the data, it includes the 4G service, it includes the hotspot, it includes the tethering, all for one low rate. I think my grand total right now, because I'm experimenting, is like right. thirteen dollars a month for a Ting plan. Seriously, it's absolutely insane. Yeah, yeah. Well, and is- really to kind of bundle that all together, so basically you are able to custom design a data centric phone plan that if you don't even use everything that first month, the next month they will actually say, "Oh, hey, let us drop you down and cost a little more, and then pay you back for what you didn't use from the previous month as well." I mean, yep. that's awesome. With, uh, with no mysterious items on your bill, Ting charges you for what you use, plus whatever taxes they're legally required to collect. There's no hidden charges, sure. no recovery fees, no BS. I love that. Uh, also, excellent support. No hold support. You call in. Imagine this. You're calling the phone company, and there's no hold support. You get a live nice. person. That's insane, right? Oh, I right? love that. I love that. I hate and, that automated stuff. And they have a very, very reasonable rate. So you can add an additional phone to your plan for a flat $6 a month. So if you want to throw a few phones on there, flat $6 a month, maybe your wife or a spouse house or or a mother or a father is one of them, and you don't want to have to worry about the tech support, give them the 1-800 number. They call in. They talk to somebody immediately, and they're going to be happy too, which makes your life easier as the tech support person in your household. You know that's going to happen. Oh, gosh. No so kidding, having that man. easy support where they just call right in is awesome. And, and the, as, a, as, a, as a customer of Ting, I got to tell you, their control panel for managing your account, checking your minutes used is brilliant. It's really well done. It's super easy to use. And one last thing I'll just give them a little plug for is they are very Android-centric, which I know is a hit with our audience. If you check out some of their devices, they've got a ton of really great unlocked devices available for immediate purchase on their website. Everything from the Galaxy Nexus to the Note 2, which I got to tell you, I'm seriously considering picking up a Note 2. If I can just somehow justify it for Linux Fest, I will. Oh, totally. You know, I mean, the Note 2 is the device I want. 
They've also got a used marketplace where you can grab a used device for a really, really great price, including the Samsung Nexus S for 200 bucks. You buy it from here, it'll come activated, and you're good to go. Now, That'd I be had my. That's nice for the kids, right? You know? Exactly. Well, so I, I had my Evo, and this is, the per this is a perfect device for me because. I have a lot of Wi-Fi devices with me, like my Nexus 7, mm -hmm. and I don't have 3G cards in them. I don't want to pay for separate 3G yeah. cards for each of them. That's just going to get ridiculous. So by getting the super low-rate Ting data service and the WiMAX service with the included tethering and hotspotting, oh, I've now just yeah. enabled all of my other devices, and I'm not going to have to worry about buying plans. And I can tether up to 10 devices with this. So it's just absolutely awesome. So go check out last.ting.com to get $25 off your first device or service. And thank you to ting.com for sponsoring this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. I am very happy. I'm very happy customer and very happy to have Ting joining us. They'll be here for the month of March, and uh, we'll be telling you more about them as we go. Last.ting.com. All right, Matt, what do you say we jump into the news segment? Let's do her. Not a ton of news this week, so I thought we'd just focus on the stuff that kind of impressed us. You know, stuff, some of the smaller stuff we might cover later on if it develops, but we're going to do a focused core news segment this week. And the cool. first story, in sort of a response to our heavy Ubuntu touch coverage last week, a little Firefox OS love. Sony is jumping on the Mozilla bandwagon and will launch Firefox OS devices in 2014. Wow. And what's, what's really kind of interesting is this is following news yesterday that LG and Hawaii are committed to launching new smartphones running Mozilla's Firefox OS platform. Now, Sony is just another person that says they'll be jumping into this. They claim they'll be having devices shipping in 2014. Sony will be working in a partnership with Telefonica, I believe is the company's huh. name, to sort of to produce this together. Telefonica wants something specific. We saw a lot of uh, Firefox OS demos out. Um, I, I think this is really, I think That's... this brings the total to 17 or 18, maybe even 19 manufacturers now that are saying they're going to ship some sort of Firefox OS based device that's interesting well now that's that's a good step compared to what I was saying last time we talked about this to where I was concerned about getting a lot of uh, people on board with this you got if you now you just need to worry about some carriers and the carriers probably will actually latch on at this point it could happen yeah um, yep. yeah I mean I I, I mean I I want I, I, I feel like I feel like I am pressured by by public opinion in some way to sit here in this chair and tell you that Firefox OS is going to be the true blue uh, savior platform for phones that runs Genuine sure. Linux that's backed by an incredible organization that we all trust that has yeah. produced incredible advances for the web over the years. But I just that's not how I feel about this. I feel like it's a Me Too phone. I've seen the demos of it. The UI is considerably underwhelming. Uh, the options that it brings to the table is nothing all of that new and, and, and innovative. And I, I understand that that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a failure. and doesn't necessarily mean that's what the entire market means. But right. I just can't get it up for Firefox OS as much as I want, and I and I I, get, I can't explain it. I don't know if Ubuntu Touch is sucking the air out of the room, or if I just think it's. Well, I think I, both I platforms, Ubuntu Touch as well as Firefox OS, the challenge that they're really going to be facing is really comes down to well, obviously the interface stuff, and then they'll work that out on their own. But yeah, really comes down yeah. to ecosystem. Ecosystem matters. Uh, you know, I have uh, you have existing apps in Android. You have existing apps in other, uh, you know, other platforms. What then? Oh, okay. So I've dropped a couple hundred bucks. Oops, that's gone now. That's I, a I big think, problem, and it's not—it's yeah. no longer just apps anymore. It's movies, books, TV right. shows, and music. You know, and that's not me hating on Firefox. I mean, if they can find a way around it, then awesome. I, you know, and I feel badly that they are faced with that challenge. I really yeah. do. Yeah. They're good folks, but yeah. it's something they're going to have to really address and address in a very cold, harsh fashion. You know. Yeah, I, I mean, like Sword Saints pointed mm -hmm. out in the uh, IRC chat room. I mean, the idea uh, is making a smart. OS that's got some level of features that sure and we need we need Linux to have a presence there so this is I'm not saying this isn't something the market needs mm -hmm. I'm just saying I don't think it's anything that we're going to have developers get excited about I don't think we're going to have developers producing a lot of apps for this we might have some you know great right. web apps yeah I, I think that I think developers that have felt now I, I disagree there I think the developers that have felt crowded out of iOS especially uh, disappointed with the Windows uh, mobile action and underwhelmed with Android maybe looking to to basically be a uh, big fish in a small pond and so there could be some opportunity there but again it's you know who's the target market's going to be using these phones will they care will they, you know so you know I, I think it may be a wait and see with a lot of developers but yeah. I think if they can get some granular action overseas especially I think that's where you're probably going to see most of this happening uh, yeah I think you'll see some developers there but I don't see a lot of action in the US and I, I think I think you probably I think you probably nailed it I just might add yeah. the other sort of challenge to this is we're talking 2014 
Right. So that's a whole another year, uh, 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 maybe another two generations, I don't know, of yeah. Android devices. They're going to be even sexier. You've got uh, how many more millions of apps and, right. and movies will be sold from the Google Play Store and the iOS App Store in that exactly. time, in, in, you know, in one more year? I mean, how much more locked in will the market be? It, uh, yeah. So I think just based on, like you, like you nailed it, based on those restrictions and realities, their only choice is primarily in developing countries. Right. Um, and but there's still opportunity to be big fish in small ponds, so it's a great point. Definitely. All right. Well, uh, so speaking of mobile operating systems, and Tizen had some action too. In fact, Mobile World Congress just wrapped up, and at Mobile World Congress, Ubuntu Ubuntu Touch was awarded uh, the best in show from CNET. Uh, I'm assuming CBS must have approved of this. <laughs> oh! Oh! Yeah. Uh, just a little uh, CES da, 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 joke there. Mm -hmm. So they got the uh, Mobile World Congress 2013 award for Ubuntu Touch in Barcelona, Spain. They said, uh, this is according to CNET, they saw a lot of interesting hardware at Mobile World Congress. And yesterday, when the team met to talk about what product should get our best show, best in show award, there's plenty of gadgets in the mix. They included the Patafone Infinity, along with uh, the phone pad and the Nokia Lumia 720, and the Xperia tablet from Sony. Nice. But after they looked at everything, their judges quickly zeroed in on Ubuntu Touch. They said uh, they said that it really impressed them. So uh, we'll have a link to we can watch their video demonstration if you want. Yeah. Uh, I thought also it was kind of weird, awkward. Mark Shuttleworth had a quote saying, "Serious people are talking about Ubuntu now, or Ubuntu Touch now, or whatever." I was like, "What right. does that? What does that even mean?" It sounds like a non sequitur to me. It's like. Serious uh, people? It, it's it's obvious for you know it's like one of those obvious statements where it's like well you think Mark but at the same time I th <laughs> I, th I think he's just it's kind of a realization of oh my gosh I might actually be onto something you know I think that's kind of so, you know just uh, yeah a deep thought kind of situation for him that maybe where he's at you know I I, I think you've nailed it in fact uh, while we're talking about Ubuntu I know how much people love this uh, they're they're getting they're getting a lot of positive attention and they're getting a lot of buzz and I think. They're acting on it sort of in a very immediate way, Canonical and Ubuntu as a whole. So a couple of things happened this week. Uh, uh, Canonical announced they're axing their uh, Ubuntu developer summits that they'd have generally before major releases got kicked off, and they're moving them to uh, Google Hangout sessions online. That's not so much the big story. However, during uh, one of John O'Bacon's, uh, you know, uh, uh, talk to the community Q&A type uh, Hangout sessions that he does once mm -hmm. a week, sure. they dedicated the entire Hangout to... Um, Switching Ubuntu to a rolling release and potentially even not having a 13.04 release, you know, the one that's coming up at the end of the next month. Oh, wow. Uh, they're considering dropping it and switching mm. at that point to a rolling release. Uh, with uh, So the way they would do this is they would have a monthly snapshot, which you could... You could download, and then all your repos would point to this monthly snapshot, so that way you'd only get big changes about once a month. But I think that would essentially mean you wouldn't get any changes throughout that month. Or you could be on a daily rolling release with the positive and negative. So the positive would be you're always going to have the latest apps, mm -hmm. you know, which is usually how I try to solve this with you know just a mess of PPA uh, repositories, right. which just gets horrible. Sure. Uh, or I, they'll have the LTS releases, so you'll get one of those, you know, every every release, and that's essentially what they're talking about moving over to. Well, and hopefully they're able to kind of look at other uh, distributions that have done this well. Um, I personally would say using Arch as a model is a, is a wise move. Arch has done a nice job in so many areas. Especially I think they're looking more probably at Debian and testing think, yeah. it unstable. Um, right. but but they're, not really, you know, they're not really following that model either. Oh, they're kind okay. of coming up with their own thing. And, and they've, mm -hmm. they've argued that they just think that uh, you know, the main focus for long-term support and stability should be the LTS is they think the interim quote-unquote releases have quote-unquote run their course. Uh, okay. Right. They say they back this up. They say businesses today support LTS releases. Uh, LTS releases are recommended to new users because they're more stable. Sure. And a, a, a limit of six month release cycle often causes features to be rushed or delayed. Daily quality of their new during the 1304 cycle has been improved considerably due to automated testing. And they say that interim releases often require ongoing support and investment. And that last little line that they throw in there is really what this is all about is they're refocusing as a company on the touch platform. Right. And they said in this Hangout that they've always considered Ubuntu to be a desktop platform, and now they're considering Ubuntu to be a convergence platform, and that it must work across all of these devices, and this six-month release cadence is taking too much of their focus away from touch. Hmm. And they can't really produce this amazing convergence OS if they're 
you know, riding this deadline clock every six months. And it may work out for them in the long run. I think it's going to be rough to start. I think we're going to see some uh, dips in the road and some speed bumps along the way, but hopefully they're able to uh, make that work for them. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. I'm a little, I'm a little concerned just that uh, it's, in the end, what it really is is sort of a really great way to wrap up and present the fact that they're going to focus less on the desktop yeah. in sort of a major focus shift. Um, but I also want more frequent app updates. I mean, I will probably be a rolling release user. So I'm not totally against this because I kind of want this myself. Sure. And sure. it's honestly like the thing that's always kind of making me look at Gen 2 and Arch. I'm always kind of going, oh, I could just have my and, cake and, and eat it too. Yep. And that's what I think will probably happen. I think a lot of existing users, myself included, will begin saying, wow, that's great. When you guys get it figured out, let me know. I will be looking at Arch derivatives. I'll be looking at other distributions, maybe some OpenSUSE, and then revisiting Ubuntu once the dust is settled. I see uh, a mass exodus of existing users in that space from the more hardcore camp, um, and myself included. I, I, I'm beginning to edge that way as it is. So, you know, I may, I may actually say, you know, honestly, I will just go ahead and drop right into an Arch and, uh, you know, just stick, stick to that situation. It, it could happen. Yeah. You know? I, yeah. I'm, I, I've kind of found myself kind of edging that way because, honestly, the PPA management, it's getting really old. And so if they're able to do this effectively, great, but I'm very skeptical initially. I think it's going to be a mess. So, you know, you may see me going arch. You don't know. Yeah. <laughs> could happen. I, yeah. I don't know. This could be the final straw. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I, uh, my feeling is, is that they, they kind of have to do something because – uh, th one of the things that they argued in their uh, in their hangout was that the web that the world has moved to web time, mm -hmm. and it sounded a little like hyperbole at first. No, he, they they're but they're it does seem that, like yeah. it does the stuff does seem to get old after a while. It does, yeah, it, it, it really does. Well, especially when you're talking about new features and things like that. And and I know that I've I threaten to you know, switch distributions and stuff all the time. You got to also realize I do use other distributions currently. I do have a, a derivative arch behind me, a Menjiro or whatever it is, I'm running on one of my computers. But I'm talking about actually rotating that in my regular cycle because of that. That you know into my regular daily use computer. So uh, web time. You know, is that is that a factor? Yeah, I think in a lot of ways it is, especially when you're talking about features and things of that sort. Sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you know what? Uh, just so that way we can drive people crazy, we might have a little bit about this next week. They mm -hmm. are uh, they're holding one of their new Ubuntu developer summits online next week, and this will be the topic du jour during that. So nice. I think we'll probably end up hearing a bit more about it. All right, Matt. Well, this was kind of a short news week. And so I wanted to use this as an opportunity to talk about something a little different. It's kind of something that I was thinking about soon. Is You remember back in the good old days when Apple was really struggling to, to gain uh, this sort of cool mystique around them? And one of the that. things that they did was they bought like, and then I guess they don't, I, I suppose they don't do this anymore. But I remember specifically in Mission Impossible, they bought like advertising in tons of movies and TV shows where the good guys would always have Apple laptops or whatever yep. with the Apple logo showing. And it kind I of, think it was 24 that was really big on that. 24 I think we did saw it for a while, of, yeah. Yeah, Alienware on the bad guys. And yeah, then, uh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure, right? Right. Well, so it struck me is one of the things, uh, I was having a conversation with a longtime friend, uh, a guy I've, I've worked with on and off over the years since the you know early 2000s, and uh, he's a big Linux guy. He's never really uh, used it like a full fledged professionally, but he's always sure. tinkered with it. Watched the show for years. Uh, uh, hi James, and uh, he um, in fact he even donated a camera to the Jupiter Broadcasting Network that we used at Linux Fest and that the uh, Jupiter Force guys used for one of the Star Trek conventions recently. So oh, he's been cool. a longtime fan of the show, and we were talking about a lot of movie production, kind of independent movie production, is moving to Indiegogo and uh, things like Kickstarter. And wouldn't it be really awesome as a community to try to work with these people to get them to use Linux in their productions, because we can kind of right. reach out to them, right, and kind of talk to them. And, and so uh, my, my friend James is involved with uh, a new production that's over on Indiegogo right now called God Machine. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, James, we, we, what, do you, what do you think about this problem? He said, well, you know, maybe there might be something to this. So I, this, check out this, this movie they're working on. It's called, it's called God Machine. I'll play a little, bit, a little bit of the trailer for you, and then I, I, then I got an idea. Let's talk about it. Okay. Imagine a future where a computer virus humans as well as machines. A future where corporations are allowed to own states. A world where an android can channel the frequency of the Big Bang, bringing herself to life and threatening the balance of power between man and machine. Science fiction or science fact? Hi there. My name is Robert Leeshock. 
I played hybrid hero Liam Kincaid on the science fiction series Earth Final Conflict, inspired by legendary creator and visionary Gene Roddenberry of Star Trek. God Machine is a story I co-wrote with several friends to explore a darker, more controversial, and perhaps more poignant landscape than anything I did while working on EFC. Yet this is exactly what attracted me to the story in the first place and why we're here looking for support on Indiegogo. I play character John Lee, a war-ravaged special ops agent, suffering both from post-traumatic stress disorder and the tragic loss of his wife. Now John becomes infected with a rare computer virus when he meets Grace, an android comfort model working in a brothel. How does a human contract a computer virus? <laughs> Through his implant technology used to suppress his PTSD and originally designed to make him a more resilient soldier to fight in a corporate controlled army. The virus All right, let's stop right there cuz wow. uh, I think that gives you an idea. It's I mean a very cool concept, right? And uh, he they are looking for support and I think it would be awesome if you guys went over to indiegogo.com/godmachinefilm and and kicked in a little money. But uh, I said to James, I said, you know, if I mention this on the show, what if we kind of got some of the audience, if they kick in, to leave some comments to kind of suggest that uh, when, they're look, when they're looking for the computer shots, like shots of screens and transferring yeah. files, Linux, right? Oh, that would and, be awesome. And so the guys that are making it, they know about Linux, like one of the other people involved with the production watches the show too. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they're, they're just like they've installed Ubuntu, they've tried loading Steam up, but they don't really know like what to show. And so they're looking for suggestions from the audience of like what kind of screen grabs to show for certain types of technical moments and get ideas and maybe even a few screenshot submi uh, submissions. So uh, when, you're over cool. at, when you're over at Indiegogo.com slash God Machine Film, look down on their page for their Facebook page or, or w any social network they have linked here that you want to get involved in and leave them a suggestion of some of the different screenshots they could do with Linux. Let's see if we can get Linux in this movie. Definitely. I mean, little KDE, little, you know, some yes. lightweight desktops. That'd be awesome. Yes. Yeah. And uh, now, I, of course, I'm kind of a fan of it, too, because they've got uh, Marina Sirtis from uh, from uh, Star Trek The Next Generation. They've also got General Martok in here from Deep Space Nine. Oh, right on. Yeah. So those are, of course, some of my favorite characters. I, I, how, how cool would it be if we could get Marina Sirtis using a Linux machine? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I'm awesome. just saying. I'm just saying. So uh, go check these guys out. I think they're awesome. They're friends of mine. And... Uh, they're uh, just getting their project uh, started over at Indiegogo.com slash God Machine Film. Kick them a few bucks and leave them a comment or a note about uh, different Linux sh uh, shots they could use, ideas. Maybe go over to their Facebook page and send them a few of your favorite techie-looking Linux screenshots. Mm -hmm. Maybe that could even show up in oh, the movie. Oh, that would be nice. I mean, you never know. Maybe nothing will make it in there, but you just never know. So uh, good luck to these guys because I think it's actually a pretty cool premise, too. Uh, Sounds cool. Yeah, yeah, we went out to dinner and we were talking about it a little bit, and uh, they played the trailer for me before they had it posted up here. I was just really impressed with the whole thing. and The whole, the whole operation is really Really neat. Um, so I'd love to. I'd love to see these sort of Indiegogo type projects. Uh, you know, starting to get a little response. It's worked so well in the gaming community. Maybe we can do it in the movie production community, and maybe cool. we'll start seeing more and more Linux out there. Wouldn't that be awesome? That would be. That, that'd be well timed. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 All right, Matt. Well, that's all the news for this week. Let's talk a little bit about Clonezilla and backing up your computer. Now, there's a lot of ways in Linux to back up your machine, of course. But this week, we're going to talk about Clonezilla because it answers a lot of problems, supports multiple platforms, and even some encrypted drives in some circumstances. So I think it could be a huge benefit to you, but it can be a little bit of a challenge to get started with. So that's what we're going to talk about in this segment. Before we do that, I want to say thank you to this segment's sponsor, System76. Go over to System76.com. That's where I got my Bonobo Extreme here. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, I have imaged many uh, computers in my day, servers, desktops, you name it, a lot, a lot. Uh, I've been imaging machines for 14, 15 years. I've never imaged, I've never witnessed a file image process happen faster than on this Bonobo Extreme. In fact, the imaging process on this Bonobo Extreme is so fast, I'm actually going to show it to you during the show because I can actually do imaging during the show. Normally, that's a process. You walk away, you let the system do its thing. No, not with the badass technology that's in the System76 Bonobo Extreme, but they also have a bunch of other great machines, including some fantastic desktops. System76, they are the creators of machines designed, built from the ground up, born to run Ubuntu, and I've talked to them, and there is some amazing technology they do on the back end that you never even hear about just to make the experience great for you. They don't feel like they have to tout that stuff because at the end of the day, what's really important is this just an amazing out-of-the-box hassle-free experience, and that's absolutely what System76 provides. So go over to System76.com and tell them the Linux Action Show sent you. Get yourself something nice, would you? Thank you to System76 for sponsoring this segment of the Linux Action Show. 
All right, so Clonezilla, what is it? Well, Clonezilla is a drive imaging software. If you're familiar with things like Norton, Norton Ghost, then you've kind of got the general idea. The problem is they always take a ton of time. A lot of times things like Norton Ghost don't support the operating system or the file system you want to use. And of course, they cost a lot of money. And the ones that are free generally are very hard to use. Now, I'm not claiming Clonezilla is the easiest system to use, but it's definitely, once you know the ins and outs, very capable. Now, I should I should probably mention, uh, Matt's, uh, Matt's not here because I needed the HDMI connection from the Skype machine to show you this to you because I want to do it in real time, but he'll be back in the next segment. So what I'm going to do, just to kind of give you a demonstration, is I have set up here on my Bonobo in VirtualBox uh, the latest version of OpenSUSE 12.3. They're beta, and man, I got to tell you guys, this isn't a review of OpenSUSE 12.3, but wow, is this distribution a looker. I've also, I should note, it boots up so fast that the music that KDE plays when you log in takes longer to play than the entire computer takes to boot. It is it is really, really something. So I figured, you know, with a great system like this, why not destroy it and then see if we can recover it? Because, you know, I love it so much. So here I am right now on uh, my already installed uh, SUSE 12.3 system. And let's uh, let's do something crazy like uh, let's run as root. So I'll type in, if I type in terminal here, you can see uh, super user uh, console comes up and it just asks me for my root password. Don't ever do what I'm doing. Never do this. Seriously, don't ever do this. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to uh, my root directory. So you can see that there. And uh, here's my uh, root directory. You can see there's an Etsy directory. Let's, let's just delete that Etsy directory. So I'm going to rm slash rf Etsy. Oh, that felt good. Let's do the bin directory too. What do you say? Uh, let's, uh, let's uh, yeah, bin. Uh, uh, let's get rid of, uh, let's get rid of uh, what, var too? Var. Oh, man, that feels good. Let's get rid of bin. Oh, gosh, that's glorious. Oh, yeah, okay, let's take a look. All right, so now we're missing. What else should I delete? Uh, should I delete uh, home? Nah, I don't want to do that. That seems almost like I'm like cutting myself at that point. Let's delete user, rm-rf-usr, right? This just, uh, no, let's just leave it. Let's just leave it like this. I, there's no way this is going to boot. There's just no way now that I've trashed this system like this, this will boot. Let's find out. Last time I did something like this was uh, when I was in high school. It's interesting, too, because now that I've deleted, it's funny how much stuff still runs when you delete things on a Linux box's root, right? I'm actually still in KDE. I wonder if, uh, can I load Dolphin? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's starting to uh, slowly fail, but you know, <laughs> you, just, you can't expect too much. You'll notice my uh, my shutdown button is gone because I've deleted things, so uh, there's no way to properly shut down the system at this point. So I'll just hard power it off. All right, so there we go. I've hard powered off my uh, SUSE virtual box. Let's see if I power it up now. Let's see if it boots. Uh, I would be pretty surprised. It might get it might get pretty far because I didn't delete. I intentionally did not delete slash boot. Uh, so here we go. Booting up now. Mm, it's actually going further than I expected. Uh-oh. We've hit our first snag. Look at that. We got nothing. Nope. We've, so we, don't have, we no longer have a bootable system, kind of as we expected. And you, you got to give it to the OpenSUSE guys. They're, uh, they're doing a pretty good job. No, it's, it's, it's kicking out a couple of errors, but uh, it's, it's, actually, it's actually a little cleaner than I expected. But this isn't going to work. This obviously is not going to work for me, so let's kill it again. And, you know, if I was, you know, if I was maybe a new user and I had accidentally done this, I'd probably be panicking right now. This is why you want to have a backup. So I'm going to go into uh, my uh, virtual machine here. Let's go into the storage and uh, in my CD-ROM. Now, I'm doing this in a series of VMs, but you could translate what I'm showing you to your desktop. So I'm, I'm going to connect in um, a, a second hard drive and an ISO image of the Clonezilla Live CD, which was just revved in the last couple of weeks. So it's pretty fresh with a bunch of new features. And so the equivalent of what you would be doing is plugging in a second hard drive into your desktop or laptop. Could be USB, could be a thumbstick, or it could be a physical hard drive. And, you're, and, the, and the other thing you'd be doing is putting the Clonezilla Live disk in your CD-ROM right now, or booting off a USB thumbstick again. So that's equivalently what I'm doing. So I'm gonna I'm gonna select the Clonezilla Live. And by the way, why not do this in VirtualBox yourself and get kind of familiar with Clonezilla before you you know jump in crazy and actually bet the farm on it? So I've selected the Clonezilla Live CD. I've got my image backup uh, virtual drive connected, which I kind of like a like a cooking show. I've already done an image backup of OpenSUSE because uh, you know I could show you that process, but I'm going to show you the restore process, which is almost identical to the backup process with just a couple of different screens. So I'm going to show them all to you in one shot. So we're going to boot off Clonezilla here, so let's boot up, hoping, uh, hoping that this all works, of course, because you know whenever you're doing something like this live, you never really know. All right, so there we go. Here's my Clonezilla grub screen. 
So uh, Clonezilla will boot up. And probably the number one bit of feedback that I've heard from people is they have no problem backing up something in Clonezilla. Where they get stuck is in the restor- restoration process. And that's because they're almost exactly the same steps. Almost exactly the same. So people people get confused that they're doing another backup when in reality they're actually, if they look carefully, you can actually choose to do a restore. All of the screens are the same. It's very confusing, but let, let's walk through these. So the first screen that comes up is just asking me for my, for my language, it's just saying, hey, do you want me to probe your key map? I'm going to say no. The next thing I'll ask you is, do you want to start Interactive Shell or do you want to go to a command prompt? I'm gonna, or I'm going to say start Clonezilla. I don't need the command prompt. Then this is the next part that's pretty important. It's going to say, do you want to do image-based backups where you're going to save everything on the hard drive or restore everything on the hard drive to and from an image? Or do you want to do a direct device-to-device copy? Now think about what that means. That means you could take a hard drive, you could put it in your machine, you could choose this device-to-device copy, and Clonezilla will copy all of the partitions, all of the data, exactly as they exist on the first drive to the second drive. And you could then take that drive, plug it in another machine, Bob's your uncle, that sucker will boot. Now, because I want to do something that's portable, I want images I can move around, I'm going to say device image. And also, since I'm restoring, I already have an image, I choose device image here. Then the next question that comes up is, do you want to use a local device, hard drive, USB drive, etc.? Do you want to back up to an SSH server? That's pretty cool, right? Uh, A Samba server, an NFS server, or you can start getting really hackerish here and just say, skip all this stuff and bring me down to the command line. I'm going to say I have a local device because I have a hard drive attached to my machine here. And uh, this gives me one last prompt to hook, hook up any USB devices I might want. Since I don't have any, I say continue. And I go ahead and it starts to probe all my different partitions. Now you can see here, my SUSE system has three separate partitions, boot, home, well, I, I probably root, home, and maybe swap. I'm not sure what the third one is. Uh, so what it says is, I see we've, I've detected a few partitions on your system. We need to mount a device as our main imaging device. This is the part where people who are restoring get really screwed up. Because what this screen is asking you is, what device do you want to back up to? Or what device do you want to restore to? But the way it's worded, it's kind of confusing. Now, I know my second drive is B, SDB, right? Because it's the second drive in my system. So I just go down here and choose SDB1. So SD is the second drive on my serial ATA bus or SCSI, and 1 is the first partition on that device. So I'm going to say save my images to SDB1. So second drive, first partition. You just say OK, and I'm going to just say save it at the top of that drive. I've dedicated this entire drive to this purpose, but you could do subfolders here. It does one last quick display. It shows you all of the available space on your mounted pl- uh, partitions, so that way you can verify you're about to image to a, to, a, to a device that has enough storage space to contain your source image, which I do. Now here you can actually, once again, step things up, but I recommend you just go to beginner mode on this next screen. You don't need to go to expert mode unless you really know what you're doing. Now here's the critical part. If you're backing up, you choose save disk. If you're restoring, you go down and you choose restore disk. That's pretty direct, right? But this is the part that really throws people off. And you can read the descriptions because I'm going to restore an image to a local disk, okay? This is what everybody gets messed up at. So if I was doing a backup, I would choose save disk. If I was doing a restore, I choose restore disk. So I'm going to hit restore disk. Now, uh, it has scanned the drive, the drive and partition I told it to, to store my images, and it has found, hey, guess what? I automatically found an image on that device for you. This is what I love about putting it at the top of the drive is Clonezilla just looks at the drive, finds the image. I don't have to give it a path or anything like that. So I say, you know what? That's the image I made last night. Let's go with that. Now it tells me what drive do I want to restore this image to because there's only one other hard drive that's not the drive that contains the image. It only gives me one option. If you had three or four hard drives, you'd have to make a choice here. I only have one other hard drive, so there's only one on the list. So I say, okay. Now this is uh, one thing that annoys people is it gives you several like real serious warnings. Like this is your last chance to be a hero. If you don't want to overwrite, in my case, my broken open SUSE install, you gotta say no here. This is your last chance. So you say, I'm gonna say yes. And it's gonna say, let me ask you again. Are you really sure you wanna continue? There's no going back. You've committed to entering the black hole at this point. So I'm gonna say yes. And now I begin to sweat. So uh, one of the things you'll notice is that uh, there's a lot of, hygiene processes that are built into Clonezilla. It's doing uh, disk checks. It'll check your grub. It'll check, uh, you know, make sure your partitions are active and all that kind of stuff. So here we go. Now Clonezilla has fired up part clone 
And you can get Park Clone on your own over at parkclone.org, and you can see it's restoring to Dev SDA2. And what I love about my Bonobo is you can see I'm getting 6.6 gigabytes a minute on the restoration. If you know about imaging, that, you know, I mean, in some cases, I'm happy when I get one or two gigabytes a minute. And so to get 6.68 gigabytes a minute is, is extremely impressive. So depending on how many drives you're restoring and depending on how many partitions you're going to restore, you're going to see this part clone launch a couple of times. So I have three partitions, so I'm going to see it launch three times. And it's going to have to restore my boot, which or whatever that first partition is, which is was apparently super quick, because now it's on dev SDA3, which is my home directory, which is pretty empty, pretty basic. So it it's, again, going really quick. Now, the last little bits that you'll see, if you watch it go by real quick, is it does some check disks. It, uh, it makes sure that uh, the, uh, the grub is installed properly on the uh, correct partition. And uh, so now I can say, okay, good job, and I'm done. So I'll just say reboot. So we'll hit reboot here at this screen, which uh, obviously starts uh, the shutdown process. Now, this would be at the point where if you're on a physical machine, you'd eject the CD and reboot the system. So we're going to say reboot. Now we've ejected our virtual box CD. There's the OpenSUSE grub loader. Now we got this last time. The question is, can we get further than this now that I've restored? So now it's booting up. It looks like we're getting progress. Boom, there we go. We're back at the OpenSUSE desktop. It's like I never deleted all of those directories off of my uh, root drive. Now, you could use this just to have a good, solid, safe backup, of course, obviously. And, you know, the fact that it supports encrypted file systems in some cases, the fact that it supports Windows and I believe Mac is a benefit. But I like this as a distro hopper who sometimes wants to load a distribution on physical hardware. I want to be able to wipe this bonobo between shows try something out on physical hardware, and then before I need to come sit down here and have everything work the way I expect and have every icon where I want it, every bookmark, I can just restore that image. And I'm right back to where I left off. If maybe maybe I'm an Ubuntu user and I want to try out Arch for a little while, but I'm not sure I want to fully commit and I only have one computer to try on, take a Clonezilla snapshot of it, save that to an external drive, then try out Arch. And if things just don't work out for you, restore the Clonezilla image, and you're right back where you left off. It's like, the, it's like, it's like if you have a virtual machine and you're able to take a snapshot. It's, it's totally awesome, and it's free. So you can get it over at clonezilla.org. I've been using this on and off for years, and uh, I, a lot of people have said, what about multiple machines at once? This has been a question that's come into TechSnap uh, quite a bit, and to them, I would point you over to Fog which I, I think you can find over at fogproject.org, or it's on SourceForge. I'll have a link to that in the show notes. And Fog is a web-based admin panel that lets you push and pull images to workstations across your whole network. It uses a lot of the same technology Clonezilla does. This is great if you have three or more machines you want to image. If you've got just a couple of machines you're taking care of, I really think Clonezilla is going to solve the problem for you. And their NCURS is based a uh, little... Uh, little uh, you know front end on their clonezilla live city makes it super easy you won't get too lost i think combined with the documentation they have there and maybe uh the tutorial the little walkthrough i just gave you here uh you'll be fine so there's lots of tools out there to do it part image is another great one uh, mondo rescue another one that i love a lot although it hasn't seen a lot of action in the last few years or last couple years but uh clonezilla through and through when it's come down to it it's always been the one that i've used when i've really had to be sure it's going to work so go check out clonezilla.org and let's go chat with Matt. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Now, Matt, we actually have a ton of emails to get through before we get out of here. It's kind of ridiculous. It, we, uh, we've been saving them up, and I, I even didn't get to all of them. I feel like a bastard. But we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, before we do, I just want to say, if you haven't checked out the new Jupiter Colony over on Google+, Plus, which you probably haven't because it's well, new. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes. I don't have a short URL yet, but we're just getting set. It's the new G plus Jupiter colony community. This is a great place if you're not a Reddit user, so you're not interacting with us on Reddit, or if you are more of a forum user, we're kind of building this up over here. We've got sections and discussion areas for each show over here. And, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a brand new community, just got started. Albert over there is working his tail off to put as much content in there as possible. So pop in there and say hi to folks and connect with your fellow Jupiter Broadcasting community member. Yep. You'll find myself, you'll find Chris, you'll find everybody. Yep. 
and uh, we don't have a short URL just yet, I don't think. We'll probably eventually get something uh, mapped over to it, but in the meantime, we'll have a link in this week's episode's show notes. Mm -hmm. All right, Matt, uh, let's start with uh, a Reddit question. Or All actually, right. it was a little bit of a feedback, just uh, to kind of wrap up from last week. Remember the topic of ZFS on Linux came up last week? Yes. And I said, hey, if anybody out there has used ZFS on Linux with a lot of data, let me know. Well, we heard from a few folks. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to Shifty21 for starting this thread in our subreddit. He talks a little bit in here about his setup. Uh, he says, this is kind of how he, he discovered this. Uh, he initially was running ZFS on FreeBSD and had a lot of trouble with the network drivers and the HBA. Uh, he, he, it just ended up being a deal breaker for him. So uh, instinctively, he tried to load CentOS 5X on it, and everything seemed to work just fine. Huh. He then installed the ZFS package from ZFS on Linux.org and crossed his fingers. Turns out everything worked. He could create his ZPools and iSCSI targets with ease. I eventually pointed, appointed my VMware ESX service to the new ZFS SAN. As Chris puts it, Bob's your uncle. It worked just fine. In fact, he said exceedingly well. In terms of stability, I've never had any issues. I had proper hardware and OS settings, and I set up my Nodios alerting accordingly and never looked back. So after over a year of 24-7 operations, I've only had two issues, and they were with hardware failures, which were easily fixed. First, I'd mentioned before, was uh, one of my Samsung SSDs crapping out on me, and then he kind of talks about the other one. Great, great post here. All in all, it's been a very positive experience. I've saved close to $250,000 in hardware and licensing and man-hour costs within the first year alone. I also have an increase of the performance of the company's cloud offering that increased the profit margins by a large percentage. We can host three times the number of concurrent users with a single ZFS SAN. Wow. But That's it would cost us five deal. times as much with a product from EMC or NetApp. Wow. 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 Yeah, yeah. And this is really where I've been seeing ZFS get used is, is in these head-to-head -head comparisons with these high-grade enterprise products mm -hmm. um, where ButterFS is, is not touching that yet. We got uh, several other people uh, all in this thread and uh, in other uh, you know avenues of feedback talking about how they've had success with ZFS on Linux, too. I, it's still one of those things I'd want to try myself, but boy, am I happy to see it's working for people. Well, it was interesting to see the uh, comparison of not only was it saving money, but it, in his particular case, for his company, it was actually making money based yeah. on performance. It's like, yeah. oh, yeah. got to love that. You know, it's interesting. That was one of the ways I, – I, I know I tell the story too much. But one of the ways I first got into Linux on the server side, not the first way, but one of the early ways, was I had an NT4 server. Uh, it might have been Windows 2000. It was just hitting a file serving bottleneck. Like it could only handle so many users. We had a couple, we had about 115 terminal servers, mm -hmm. and all of the users would all log in right as the bank opened up, and they'd all be loading their roaming profiles and their bookmarks and their documents all at once across 42 branches of, of this bank. And it would just slam this Windows machine. It would take the logins 10, 15 minutes. The roaming profiles would just be dogs. And I swapped it out to a Samba server running on Mandrake Enterprise or Server Edition, whatever right. they called it back then. We never hit a, a, a ceiling again. As long as I worked there six years after that fact, we had never hit a ceiling after switching to Samba and Linux. So I, I have personally witnessed how swapping over to a, some new technology like this can make a dramatic improvement in... I mean, that meant all the tellers... You know, that meant the lines were shorter at the teller lines. That meant the loan officers were getting up and taking, you know, working with customers that were there at the beginning of business. I mean, it improved things across the board. So I've, I've seen this myself. Very well, cool. and I think what you said was interesting is that, because I've seen this come up in various uh, posts and forums and stuff like that, uh, that it's not that you're saying I'm hating on a particular platform. You're saying I'm looking at cause and effect. And in this particular case, this technology worked better than that other technology. I, I, and I, I think the, that's interesting. I think yeah. ButterFS has an amazing future ahead of it. I just don't think yeah. it's I don't think it's competitive with with ZFS right. yet. And I right. think ZFS is continuing to move forward. Uh, so we'll see where it ends up. But maybe sure. in a few years, it, it will be a moot point. Uh, Jason wrote in with a little success story. He says, "Hey guys, I'm listening. Oh, I'm a learning assistant at a local community college here in uh, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we do in my in my department is provide GED and college prep courses to students." Cool. Right now, we have a GED orientation taking place where students register and take assessment exams so that we may place them in the correct GED prep course. Hmm. I was able to connect my little HP laptop running Ubuntu 12.04 to the lo local network, download printer drivers, and get all of the students' test keys printed. This is my first time using Linux for work, and I have to say, I'm gleefully impressed. Just thought I would share my little Linux experience with you. Thanks for all that you guys do. I fully enjoy watching LASS. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. That, that's I, really cool to hear. That is good to hear. You know, I love hearing last or last. I love hearing Linux work in work. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, and and to actually to share in that joy. You know, mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. really cool. 
Uh, another viewer, uh, 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 I'm totally blanking on his name right now. I apologize. But he sent in uh, his game has hit Steam. Uh, it's called Spirits. It's also been available on Android. In fact, I've played it for a long time on Android. Spirits is a puzzle game. It's got this really cool uh, orchestra music soundtrack to it. It's about nine bucks in Steam. And you play these little wisp-like things that you... You, you, you generally, the idea is you sacrifice a couple of them so that way mm -hmm. you can get the other wisps to the goal. And the puzzle is in how you sacrifice them, what you order them to do to get all the other guys to the other place. And they're always moving forward. So you always kind of have to be thinking it's, it's not stressful, but it's very engaging. So it's a good way to relax and play a very beautiful game with very nice uh, effects and sound um, without getting all anxious you know without shooting people so it's well, called spirits. by moving forward it looks like that you there's no like when they're moving there's no pause button to keep right. some of them still and some <laughs> right. of them moving it looks like they're constantly in yeah. motion so you really have to think three or four steps ahead yeah and that's but that's the kind of that's the kind wow, of game cool. i like where you kind of you're kind of you, like you said you're kind of saying okay well in four or five moves i'm gonna need to know how to i'm gonna need to be at this place so i need to do this now in order to get ready for that and that's sort of the puzzle element to it and it just gets better and better each level by the way hand drawn too Wow. Yeah, they're wow. gorgeous. Gorgeous. Uh, so go check out Spirits uh, 999. Just came av just uh, available on Linux this week. So congrats to them and fans of the show, too. That's I didn't awesome. even know that because I've played Spirits on the, uh, on the Nexus 7 for yeah. a while now. All right, next cool. email came in from Lee. And this one, I think, let's talk about this, Matt. It's, it's right. kind of funny because just during the uh, break, we had a little pulse audio trouble. But he says, hi, guys. I really enjoy the show. I've been watching for a couple of months now. After last week's last, I had a couple of questions. Firstly, I'd like to suggest slash request a review or demo of Pulse Audio. It's okay. been mentioned a couple of times over the last few weeks, but I know very little about what it can do. My other question is, do you know of a System76 type company in the U.K.? Uh, I've been looking for a machine, but uh, he said something that will run Linux great. But mm -hmm. the problem is System76 ships to the UK, but between the exchange rate and the import tax, they have to get right. a lower spec machine. Any suggestions would be great. Well, let's take the first one, and then we'll answer the second one. So okay. what do you think of – th is, there, is there an episode segment we could do around Pulse Audio? There are. I think to make it m the most compelling situation for everybody possible, um, you know, obviously the basic functionality of uh, you know, mic handling and uh, output handling and things like that, of course, is that's a no-brainer. But I think it would be cool if we could actually send audio from one machine to another and yes. actually show that reception. I think that for advanced users would be more engaging and more interesting we to could, see as well. I think we could do that. We, should, mm -hmm. we could make a segment out of that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, Pulse I, I, is very powerful. All right. Maybe we'll do that. Um, yeah. So to his question about um, uh, a, a provider other than System76, uh, you, you might consider, oh, you know, yeah. there's, there's, all, there's all your standard options, of course, out there. But you might yeah. also consider if you're not going to get a System76 machine, maybe build it yourself. You could do that, yeah. That and might we, be, and that might be the best alternative if you're if it's cost prohibitive. And uh, we just had a thread season. started by, uh, uh, oh boy, is as all I say this one in the subreddit, and he's got rec it's recommendations for custom built PC, and there's a bunch of people in the subreddit who've chimed in with the hardware they've used to custom build their Linux box. So you can get some very current, you know, recommendations, some very current advice yeah. on what might be good hardware. So that's one route to go is build your own. Sure. Do uh, you have any other suggestions? Honestly, I can't think of any specific company names off the top of my head. You probably will find Google is your Google's your buddy uh, to actually use uh, Google UK and actually search for yeah. uh, Ubuntu pre-installed or I mean, Linux pre-installed. Yeah, the ones that come to mind are all the well-known, like, you know, there's the Dell, XPS, Sputnik. Yeah. There's all that stuff, but... I Honestly, I'm not a big fan of that stuff, so I don't. No, I don't know if no, I not. really come with a recommendation. I would definitely go with one of the smaller guys. Uh, they, like I said, there's. I know there are some that are UK centric, and they do exist um, for you know for a variety of reasons. So I would definitely just let Google be your guide on that. I don't have one recommendation over another. I would simply find a company that you're interested in, and then do some research and find out what other people are saying about that company. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I like that, Matt. I like that. Okay, Doki. Next email comes in, and it's from Gene. Mm -hmm. says, hey, Chris and Matt, or, I uh, just saw your show on the Ubuntu for phones and how Canonical is using CyanogenMod to overcome the need for special device drivers thanks to the underlying basic Android system. This leads me to think that maybe finally a fully hardware accelerated full desktop Ubuntu might come to small Android on a stick devices like the MK802, allowing users for some really nice low-cost streaming options for their TVs or even desktop replacements. Anyhow... I can see it's still a long way to go to reach the final version for the OS and even further down the road to get a complete Ubuntu desktop on right. the system. Just wanted to add these maybe upcoming options for Canonical and get your thoughts. Thanks for the great show and greetings from Germany. 
I like the idea, but I would say that even considering what you would use, like the, he's talking about the little USB uh, Android device that you can like plug into yeah. stuff. Honestly, because they've got like XBMC and stuff like that for it already in an Android world, mm -hmm. um, I would rather see that polished further than trying to reinvent the wheel and going with an Ubuntu option. Sure, sure. And um, probably just load XBMC on top of Ubuntu if you did get it, right? Yeah, and it would just weigh it down more. Whereas the existing Android XBMC option, it's got it's not perfect. It, you know, you're talking about some resource usage and things like that, and certain resolutions get a little funky. But I honestly rather see the time invested in that myself. I'm not positive yeah. that Canonical intends to sit, stick with CyanogenMod after a certain point. Right. There's been some talk that they only use CyanogenMod to get it out there to get people developing applications for the platform mm -hmm. and that they might not use that down the road. That almost seems like if they keep using CyanogenMod, that's going to get harder and harder and harder to get away from. So I'm not sure, though, that CyanogenMod is actually a long-term thing for Ubuntu Touch. Yeah, it's a good Could point. Could be a temporary sort of stint. It, it, and it very well may actually just be... Uh kind of a little uh, crossover for them but um, in the short term. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see what they come up with and uh, you know, as far as what their long-term plans are, I definitely think that they're laser-focused in mobile and uh, will probably make that a bigger priority than anything they do on other devices such as the little, uh, you know, little Android stuff. Or so. the desktop. Yes, or the desktop. Yeah, well, you know. The beauty of that is, is the beauty of Linux is, is that there's lots and lots and lots of distributions mm -hmm. and so if that doesn't uh, pan out long-term... You know what? That's okay. That's it their will, loss, uh, not ours. Yeah, it will move on. You know, I'm, I'm not worried about it. Really, I'm not. So. Uh, Stifelophus writes in. He says, mm -hmm. uh, "Hey guys, my boss, who's a total Windows admin, caught wind of OwnCloud, so I pointed him to the OwnCloud coverage you did about a year ago on last season twenty, episode eight. I'm wondering if you'd consider revisiting OwnCloud and let us uh, and let us in on our on its current status and any tricks and tips that would help convert my boss to Linux." as he installs on cloud. Thanks for producing the best Linux podcast on the web and for TechSnap shirt I'm going to wear to work when I quit my job. God bless. <laughs> so, well, own cloud has been covered on the show, but I got to say it does seem to be a topic of interest in among our audience and they just recently uh, released a new version of own cloud that they say adds video streaming support, but they're not very specific Whoa. on what that means, but they've right. also added something that I've really 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 wanted in own cloud. Mounting of external storage, which was a little flaky when I tested it last time, oh. now includes not only Dropbox, but Google Docs, Swift, and Amazon S3. So you could you mm -hmm. could mount an Amazon S3 as a back-end storage to your own cloud box. So you could sort of offload certain things to S3. Uh, they now also support file versioning, so if somebody borks something up, you can revert back. Syncing of shared address books is very nice. I'm starting to see a lot of things that we could use this for Jupyter Broadcasting for collaboration. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, enhanced sharing. But the other thing that they've added that wasn't, it's been ever been in now for a little while, but wasn't in it when we talked about it, is uh, desktop apps to sync sort of all the Dropbox from a local folder on your hard drive up to your own cloud server. Which wow. could be pretty nice. That so, could be cool. That you know, that might be worth a revisit just to kind of basically yeah. do a, a feature demonstration, and then to, and then basically point people at a documentation to get their own setup going. I don't know if we'll do it before Linux Fest, but I, I think not. I might. I, I don't. We'll see. We'll see if it fits in, but I might put it on the list because it. I I've been trying to come up with a, a calendar and and shared address book solution for Jupyter mm -hmm. Broadcasting, and none of us work in a physical office, and I don't really right. want to put everything on Google. Right. I mean, I can. We are doing that now. Yeah. But it but know. it does put a lot of, you know, if if something horrible happens or just, you know, just have a bad day with something. Yeah, I mean, that date is gone. Then what, right? I mean, that's a that's a yeah. hassle. Yeah. Uh, this is and that's why I like I like the idea of sort of replacing Dropbox with something I own mm -hmm. inside my own, you know, my own walls. Um or even if I have it hosted somewhere, at least I have full control over it. Exactly. Because it's not just enough to liberate the data. It's also nice to know that you can be in charge of backing it up. Yeah, exactly. And that I can, you know, get my hands on it. But I like yep. the idea of maybe I could do like an encryption or something and maybe offload monthly archives to S3 or something. Oh, yeah. That, that might be one. So you kind of then you get bust of both worlds a little bit. I like that. All right, next email, okay. and this is uh, second to last email. Christoph writes in, just a little success story here. He says, hi, Chris and Matt. I've been watching numerous episodes of your show on YouTube over the past few weeks, and I found them really informative and entertaining. He says, I live in Belgium. Not really practical to watch you guys live. So he watches them on demand, which is totally fine. Yeah, yeah. I've been a Mac head for 14 years, and I know and love the system in and out. I've also been playing with the terminal in OS X for quite some time, during which I learned a thing or two about the command line, 
and I'm amazed how powerful it really is. If you know what you're doing, that is. Exactly. I've never even thought about switching to another operating system again, but after trying out numerous dual boot setups with OS X and Linux, I've decided not to replace my 2000 iMac with a new one, but instead to buy a Lenovo E53 laptop, which I'll be using as my main computer with Linux exclusively. My iMac will remain on my desk, only to be used for video editing and to keep up to speed with all things OS X. I'm still in doubt as to how much with, with Linux distribution I'm going to use, but I am considering a combination of Zubuntu and Mint in a dual boot setup. Watching your show has effectively made me realize how much fun Linux is, and I guess you could say that you guys helped me cross the line. So, you see, your power of persuasion even reaches as far as Belgium. The force is strong with you. Keep up the good work. Christoph. You know, it's interesting because uh, his experiences are very similar to mine in that I, when I was basically tinkering with Linux, you know, I played a little Red Hat and whatnot, you know, in the early days, what really pushed me over the edge was running it on a notebook. Mm. Um, because then it was like, you know, well, you know, I'm still a very much a Windows guy or whatever, and I would still run my legacy apps on my desktop. But the laptop gave me a little more freedom to try things and experiment and, uh, oh, I don't know, run those old Orinoco cards, you know, the little yeah. slider guys. Remember the old school stuff, right? Yeah. to 11B. So, you know, that was when I really started using it more heavily and, and on more dedicated. And then I, you know, found over time that I was able to then just uh, go completely dedicated. And uh, I think he might actually find himself going that direction. He may actually find himself with a Mac that he's finding that rather dated that yeah. then he dr drops, uh, you know, a lightweight desktop on it. It's like, oh, hey, it's like a brand new computer. I get, I get the Mint, switching from yeah. the Mac to Mint. But Zubuntu, sure. that's, that's a pretty big change from the old OS stand. But you know what? Sometimes that's good, right? You kind of kind of feel like you get back to the more classic computing environment, which can be empowering. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, so, it's, yeah, it's a little, little lightweight, but, you know, it's... Uh, and if, he's, if he gets comfortable with that desktop, I see a future of seeing that on his Mac in the not-too-distant future. Yeah. 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 I can see that happening. Uh, all right. So the last one we'll get to uh, this week uh, came from Zanaris in the uh, subreddit. And he says, I'm thinking of buying a game controller, a gamepad. I'm wondering if you guys have any recommendations. Mm. He says, uh, you know, uh, he's going to be running it on Ubuntu 1204, 64-bit. Sure. And after watching the Must Try Games last episode, he thinks... And by the way, I bought... A, I bought um, uh, what game did I just get? I just got a oh. new game that is controller. Two of my most recent Steam games are really controller friendly, right. and uh, I, you know, they're not. A controller is not a ton of money, and some of these games on Linux are a lot of fun with controllers. So I fully, fully recommend. Now I had like the Logitech Dual Stick was the one I used. Mm -hmm. I just plug it right in, works fine with Linux. A lot of people on the subreddit, Matt, were recommending the Xbox 360 wired controller. Oh yeah, I was going to say any type of, uh, you know, uh, any type of USB device that's designed for gaming. You know, I, I cannot stress yeah. this enough. It's going to work. It's going to probably, you may have to remap some stuff. I was surprised along the way, though. But yeah, they were saying work. that it's, but they were saying specifically the Xbox 360 controller works great. Yeah. I, yeah I'm, it's I, Microsoft. I, I, I'm not, but I'm not surprised by that. I, you know, I've seen, yeah. I've seen certain Microsoft hardware actually run pretty well. Yeah. And you it's know, it's kind of comical. The truth, the truth of it is, is a lot of these games, because the com, that controller is so common, mm -hmm. they have like other graphics are like a, like, obviously the xbox 360 controller when you're in the control right. setting they're not always the exact image but they're so obviously it's supposed to be the 360 <laughs> controller that i would believe that a lot of times if you just came out of the box with a 360 controller and plugged in all of the key mappings totally done for you oh i'm sure so and, not and, be surprised. And, and you know it's not a bad controller either no it, it's really not that bad of a controller uh, it's that one division in microsoft that actually is uh, done pretty well <laughs> but, uh, yeah and how, you know what? i'll go check amazon because i don't actually think it's probably even that much money no Right, you can get, uh, get it cheap. I'm sure, you can, especially if you watch the lightning deals and stuff like that, you can get it really cheap. Yeah, it, but they they were saying in the uh, they were saying in the subreddit if you want wired. So wi the wired Xbox 360 controller and it's even primable is uh, 30, 37 bucks on Amazon. I'll put a link to that in the show notes if you want to grab that and support the show. That's a um, good investment. You know. Yeah, especially with these games coming out with so much mm -hmm. controller support. All right, Matt. Well, guess what? That wraps up this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. Why don't you tell people what uh, they can find you doing throughout the week? Uh, as always, you can find me at datamation.com. Scroll down to open source and you will find me there. Uh, otherwise, you can find me at my Facebook page, which I believe is going to be slash <laughs> Matt Hartley Public. Yep, if I that's finally it. got that URL right. So, yep, yep. That's, that's it. You got it, sir. Uh, and don't forget, you can join us live 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. UTC, and of course, 10 a.m. Pacific over jblive.tv for the video and jblive.info for the audio Sunday mornings, every single Sunday. We have a new episode, and then we release later on in the uh, afternoon. Of course, you can also subscribe to any of our feeds. We have those posted on every single show page. Just go click on an episode, scroll down a little bit, and you can find RSS feeds. Subscribe, 
and you get the show automatically in just about any format you could possibly want. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's ridiculous. And Crazy. don't forget about that Tech Snap episode 100 and 101 are going to be filmed back to back this Thursday, starting at 11 a.m. Pacific Hour Time. Tons of Tech Snap. It's probably going to be five hours worth of show and of course not that much show will get released so if you really sure. want to see all, and it's going to be fun so it's it's always you know whenever it's a big event it's always fun to do something special like a block party right yeah, yeah. join us for a TechSnap <laughs> block party totally yeah alright everyone well thank you for tuning to this week's episode of the Linux Action Show we'll see you right back here next week Well, you don't really get a choice if you're dark. You're emo, and you're dark this week, so ah, you're going to be yes. emo. I mean, I got a, and I got the hoodie, so that really, that totally goes right. And, and if you were Elmo, that would mean you have a hand up your butt. Have you guys heard of clone frickin' Clonezilla? Hey, hey guys, have you heard of Clonezilla? Star Wars, Star Wars getting bought by Disney. They're going to make like a movie a year, kind of. That's crazy, right? I mean, well, this is that's not the world we live in. That's Star Wars.